Seoul's Transport Ministry earlier forecast a jump in domestic summer travel by Koreans starting late July to early August. So where are they headed? And what makes Korea appealing for travel? Meanwhile, how are pundits responding to concerns of overcharging? Hello and welcome. You're watching Issues and Insiders for this Thursday afternoon, August 1st, here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. The peak summer holiday period here in the country dates from late July to early August. That being said, today we delve into Korea's travel trends this season. For this, I have Professor Shin Hak Sung at Hanyang University live on the line. Professor Shin, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Yeah, it's my pleasure to join the program again. I also have Chris Tharpe. Travel writer based over in Busan. Chris, it's been a while. Welcome back. It's great to be back, Sunny. Right, Chris, what do you believe is the travel trend of Koreans this summer holiday? Well, despite uh, growing numbers of Koreans going abroad, domestic travel is still number one this summer. People are uh, heading to really good spots here on the peninsula. You know, uh, Jeju Island is always a nice place to cool off this time of year. We're seeing mainly sort of beach destinations as the number one thing. Uh, Korean travelers tend to, uh, you know, book a room in a really nice hotel where they can relax on the beach. So hotels are kind of a, the most important part of the travel sector here because I think people like to go somewhere nice and relax where they can eat good food and uh, kind of beat the heat because we know how hot it is. But staycations are kind of becoming a thing here in Korea as well. A lot of people are just opting to use whatever time off to relax at home. I, that's been my vacation this year. I've been doing a lot of laying in front of the fan. Uh, but as far as international destinations, Europe is number one as far as I know. And I know anecdotally, Talking to a lot of older, retired Koreans, uh, they've been heading to Europe this spring and summer, especially Turkey. Turkey seems to be a really hot destination right now, especially for package tours, which uh, Koreans who travel abroad still tend to use package tours, 9, 10, 14, 15 day excursions where everything is kind of included. They just pay one fee. It's kind of comfortable. But we are seeing a trend of younger Koreans going abroad now to places like Europe and North America. We're talking Koreans in their 20s and 30s. And these travelers are tending to avoid the package tours. They're a bit more adventurous, a bit more independent. So uh, this is increasing. Uh, so uh, these are the trends that I'm seeing uh, right now this summer. Right. More younger Koreans seeking to go abroad, especially after the pandemic, actually, Chris. Yeah. And on a more sobering note, Professor Shin, concerns regarding overpricing practices remain rampant here in the country. How severe would you say is the situation, Professor Shin? Yes, uh, the, the issue of overpricing is a common problem in tourist destinations, and it seems to have become a global phenomenon as international tourism has revived from COVID-19. Uh, to understand this issue, I think it's important to distinguish between overpricing and price fraud. Overpricing refers to situations where the quality of services or purchased goods is significantly lower than the amount paid. On the other hand, price fraud goes beyond overpricing and involves pricing that imposes an unreasonable financial burden. As we have seen high prices at tourist destinations, overpricing is somewhat tolerated under the logic of supply and demand. However, price fraud has become a significant issue, particularly when targeting foreign travelers by deliberately imposing excessively high prices. And this problem has been exacerbated by the increasing number of foreign visitors to Korea, especially those drawn by a fascination with Korean culture. And these tourists often face overpricing or price fraud in products related to Korean culture, such as K-food, K-beauty services, and medical services, which is an urgent issue that needs to be addressed. Right, indeed. And overpricing practices, however, are not unique to South Korea, Chris. There have been reports of excessive prices at tourist destinations beyond borders, of course. What do you suppose, Chris, can be done to discourage such practices? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, 
you know, I'm really not sure beyond like government price controls what really can be done. I think part of the burden lies with travelers themselves. Uh, if you choose, let's say, to go to Venice or Santorini uh, at the peak of tour season, you will overpay. It's going to be expensive. So I think uh, travelers themselves can be more discerning about their destinations, perhaps avoid the really uh, over-touristed, crowded places, especially, let's say, Europe. You know, go to second-tier cities. Get away from the, the big, most popular destinations. I think, first, you're, you will have a more enriching experience, and you, you'll pay less. It's just not going to be as expensive. But if you just follow the herd and go where everyone else is going, uh, you're probably uh, going to feel that on your wallet. So I think if travelers take it upon themselves to to make deeper choices, to think about where they're going a bit more than just following the trend, uh, we will see prices that are more reasonable and uh, it will be a better experience overall. Right. And Professor Shin, for here in the country, what measures do you propose to perhaps better tackle uh, overpricing practices? Yeah, first, it's essential to establish clear standards for identifying overpricing. As I mentioned earlier, we need to admit that prices for products or services in most major tourist destinations can be higher than normal prices. However, when there is overpricing or price fraud beyond these standards, proactive measures are necessary. In my view, these measures can be divided into preventive actions and post-instant responses. For preventive actions, deploying Mistelli shoppers to major tourist sites can help monitor prices and eliminate unfair pricing practices. And this approach is already being implemented in Seoul by Seoul's metropolitan government. On the other hand, post-instant responses include operating traveler support, support centers or complaint centers particularly in major tourist destinations like Seoul or Jeju, to assist foreign tourists. In fact, some of these centers currently offer cash compensation for overcharges and accept reports of various inconvenient cases, including unfair pricing. Above all, it's crucial to raise awareness among tourism service providers and merchants and impose clear penalties for unfair pricing practices. Right, for sure, of course. Moving forward, uh, Chris, a British travel magazine recently selected Korea as an appealing travel destination. Do tell us a bit about this particular selection and your thoughts. Uh, yes, this is Wanderlust, which is the biggest travel magazine in the UK, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, they, uh, their issue on Korea is an 18-page spread, so that's pretty, pretty major coverage in the travel writing world. And it, um, you know, highlighting places such as Gyeongju, Andong, Seoul, Suwon, and Jeju-do, uh, trekking and walking paths in Jirisan and Changwon and Soraksan, Bukhansan. Also, they're highlighting Suncheon Bay and Pyeongchang, and of course, uh, Busan and Yeosu, with an emphasis on K-pop and K-drama destinations. Uh, this is just part of a greater trend. I know. This is what's kind of made my career as a travel writer. Just living in Korea, Korea is suddenly hot. You know, Korea's in the spotlight and people want to write about it. People want to come here. I know just this year, uh, I, I do a lot of work in the UK. So I'm familiar with uh, kind of the climate there. And I've just done four articles on Busan for National Geographic. I did a 3000 word spread for the Telegraph in London. So especially in the UK, there's really keen interest in Korea right now. Uh, it seems to be, you know, the hot destination. And uh, I also, you know, I, I have connections with some travel companies there, and they tell me that just this last year, their bookings for Korea are up 40%. So people are coming here. Uh, you know, the secret's out. I've lived here for 20 years. I've known all along how cool it is, what a really rich, unique place this is. Um, but 20 years ago, people didn't know. I would be traveling and I would meet people uh, maybe in Southeast Asia or I'd be back home or in Mexico. I'd meet like Europeans or other people and I'd say, I live in Korea. And they'd ask me, what, north or south? They didn't really have a, uh, a concept. Oh, and I'd tell them South Korea and they didn't really know what to think of it. 
And now when I tell people I live in South Korea, you know, invariably their jaw kind of drops and like, wow, really? Oh, I really want to go there. I've seen this movie. I, you know, I, I follow this program. I love Korean food. They might have even studied a little Korean. They might know a few phrases, which, you know, 20 years ago, no one outside of Korea would know any of the language. So it's just part of the sort of global uh, sensation that South Korea is now. Um, so I would see, you know, more media. I would expect to see more of this sort of coverage. Um, I just hope as tourism increases here that Korea can find a way to make sure it's done responsibly uh, without the negatives of over-tourism that we see in Europe especially. Right, for sure. Chris, according to the Henley Passport Par Index, South Korea ranks third with regard to passport par worldwide. Now, the ranking, of course, differs depending on the entity that conducts this particular research. Generally speaking, though, Chris, how is a passport par measured? Um, yeah, passport power is generally calculated just by how many countries a passport holder of that nation can visit visa free. So that means you don't have to, if they're on a visa waiver program, you don't have to go to the embassy and get a visa, pay for a visa before you go. So uh, South Korea is among the top as far as that's concerned with 191 visa free countries at their disposal. Number one is Singapore right now. Singapore is 195. Number two is France, Germany, Italy, and Spain with 192. And number three is Austria, Finland, Ireland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Sweden, and South Korea with 191. So um, we, you know, we see three Asian countries, you know, dominating these days in the top three. Always Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. And so this is really cool because, uh, you know, again, 20 years ago when I came to Korea, Koreans needed visas to visit the United States. Koreans needed a visa to just go over to Japan. In 2006, uh, on average, just world average, uh, a person with an average passport could visit 57 countries. And now in 2024, that's increased to 107 countries. So, I mean, I think this is a real point of pride for South Korea to see this uh, passport power. Uh, you know, a South Korean passport is more powerful than my passport an American passport, which many years ago was considered the gold standard. So, you know, Korea surpassed the United States and surpassed many European countries in this respect. It's really extraordinary because many years ago, this was not the case. And it just goes to show how much the world has changed, how much we're more interconnected and just how far Korea has come, you know, as an economic powerhouse. But part of it's also perception, you know, when you get when your country gets placed on a visa waiver, it's it's partly about how rich your country is, but it's also kind of the general positive perception that your country has in the world or by that nation. So this shows, uh, you know, just the kind of the international goodwill directed at South Korea. It's reflected in the passport power. So I think this is very cool. <laughs> Right, and staying with that, Professor Shin, beyond the convenience of having a strong passport, what do you suppose are the broader implications of a powerful passport? Uh, the power of a country's passport holds two meanings. Firstly, passport power reflects the outcomes of the country's neutral foreign policy. Generally, countries with high passport power maintain relatively neutral uh, diplomatic relations with other nations. Whereas countries with low passport power are typically those experiencing internal conflict or dispute with other countries. And secondly, passport power indicates the significance of a country's outbound travel market. Countries with high passport power usually have a substantial outbound tourism market or significant purchasing power, contributing positively to the inbound tourism market of other countries. For instance, before the COVID-19 pandemic, South Koreans ranked sixth globally in terms of overseas travel spending. Consequently, the number of countries allowing South Korean tourists to enter without visa has increased, which enhances South Korea's passport power. Additionally, passport power reflects the trustworthiness of citizens from the host country. In other words, the Exemplary travel behavior of Koreans 
abroad and their low likelihood of engaging in illegal immigration or crime contribute to the trust placed in South Korean tourists. Overall, South Korea's high passport power can be attributed to its neutral diplomatic policies, the strong positions of each outbound tourism market, and the high level of trust in its travelers. Right, good to know. Meanwhile, Professor Shin, the recent fiasco involving e-commerce platforms, Timon and We Make Price, it seemed to be affecting um, summer travel plans for many here in the country. What are your thoughts on this fiasco? Yeah, um, I'm also sad to think that uh, the situation will add further difficulties to the tourism industry, which was recovering after the COVID-19 crisis. I believe that the biggest victims of this situation are the travelers who cannot depart after purchasing travel packages and the travel agencies that have not been able to recover their sales. The main reason travel agencies are significantly impacted is that unlike tangible products or goods, travel packages deal with intangible services, making refunds or repurchases difficult. And recently, many travel agencies have terminated contracts with e-commerce platforms like Timon and We Make Purchase, which result in the cancellation of sold travel packages. And this means that consumers must rebook through the travel agencies, which is not as simple as it sounds, because consumers purchase the travel packages product at a very low price through these e-commerce platforms. This makes it difficult for travel agencies to offer the same travel packages at such low prices. And additionally, in a situation where the e-commerce platforms find it difficult to guarantee a refund, consumers may be reluctant to repurchase again. As a result, there may be an increase in cases of people giving up their travels, which will inevitably have a negative impact on the tourism industry. To prevent such situations in the future, I believe that the current payment systems on e-commerce platforms needs to be improved, and the typical low-margin, high-volume sales strategy for travel production needs to be changed as well. Right. Hopefully, we'll have a better safety network in the future then, especially to prevent the uh, repercussions that ordinary consumers face. Chris. Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions for summer travel here in Korea this year for foreigners and locals alike, including me, have yet to go on a summer vacation? <laughs> uh, I think my first suggestion would be to get out of the city if possible. I think cities in the summer are hotter than uh, outside. So my first suggestion, of course, would be Sokcho, which is one of my favorite towns in Korea, because Sokcho has it all. You have the mountain, you have Soroksan National Park right there, Ulsan Bawi, the big rock formation that's just dramatic, that kind of uh, you know sets the stage above the town. The town itself is great. There's a great seafood market. You have fresh seafood, uh, some really good restaurants. It's kind of quaint and really laid back. The people are really friendly. And then there's also great beaches uh, around Sokcho that you can experience if you're a beach person. Uh, you can head south to Yangyang and try to do some surfing, uh, try your hand at that. But that whole area is just, um, you know, really perfectly made for summer. And that would be my first suggestion, you know, Gangwondo in general. Uh, another really good choice is a place I went some years ago would be Ulungdo, which is Ulung Island, which you can get from uh, uh, the east coast of Korea. It's a couple hour ferry ride out in the middle of the East Sea. And it's a really dramatic, really cool piece of real estate. It's basically this kind of sheer rock formation that's an island that comes up out of the water, this crystalline aquamarine water that's really clear and, you know, perfectly clean. You can swim, you can fish. It's a really good place to unwind. And it's unlike anywhere else I've been in Korea. I've been to a lot of islands, but Ulingdo really has a very unique feel. It's far enough away from the Korean peninsula that it, it just kind of has a vibe that's different than the mainland. And you can also take a day trip to go to Dokdo, the Dokdo Islets, uh, which are a couple hours from Ulingdo. I did that. You know, I went to Dokdo and it was actually very, I was surprised. I did it. It's kind of a cultural thing. 
thinking, oh, uh, people, Koreans talk about Dokdo, they're very passionate about it. But when I, when I actually saw them, these islets in the middle of the ocean, they were really beautiful. They were starkly, uh, you know, just these rock formations that kind of stirred my soul, like just as uh, pieces of nature, they were quite stirring. Uh, so, you know, my summer travel suggestions do go around water, uh, maybe head to Tongyong and the uh, Hallyo Haesung National Park, which are all the islands around Tongyong. Tongyong is a great traditional town with lots of history. Again, a wonderful seafood market. And the islands like Bijindo and Hansando are islands you can get to very easily, just uh, you know, within an hour of Tongyong. And you can explore these islands and find these really good beaches, things like that. And then if you want to go inland, I would suggest Jirisan National Park. Some years ago, I hiked the Jirisan Dulegil, and the Jirisan Dulegil is a circuit path that goes all around Jirisan, and it's hikeable in the summer because these valleys, it goes up and down these little valleys that are really picturesque, and there's minbak, so there's like homestays, places to stay, places to eat in most of these valleys, and it's just really scenic, very cool. It's a great way to beat the heat. There are temples everywhere and just deep forest. Jirisan is one of my favorite places in Korea. And, uh, you know, I, anytime people ask me where to go in Korea, I always suggest Jirisan because it's kind of under the radar. It's far enough from Seoul that a lot of people from Seoul don't go there. Uh, and Busan, it's kind of its own thing. So I would suggest that. And then another good kind of water port town is Mokpo, of course, in South Jola province. You can access many islands from Mokpo. And Mokpo is also very historical. It's, it's this really interesting town with a really good history and great food, of course, because that part of Korea, uh, South Jola province, is known for its fiery, really deep, unique takes on Korean cuisine. A lot of people say it's the best place right. to eat in the country. Um, yeah, I, I, I would put it with anywhere I've been. The people are very friendly. They're down to earth. And um, it's a really good place. If you want to see the real heart of Korea, Right, that province Chris. maybe has it. Yeah. I'll have to agree. So the gist of your message, Chris, is to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city, to either seek the sea, the beach, or the mountain then. All yeah. right, Chris, as always, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. And Professor Shin, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, that ends this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow.